Hello, everybody. On behalf of CND and Beyond Nuclear, thank you for joining this evening's discussion, Nuclear Exploitation, How Uranium Mining Harms Communities. Uranium is mined to produce nuclear power and nuclear weapons. In addition to those horrors and the problems they present, this activity is devastating for the communities, very often of indigenous people, working in and living near the mines. And as well as immediate and ongoing harms, the contamination from uranium mining persists for thousands, tens of thousands of years, and it leaves a dangerous legacy for current and future generations. Countries, including Britain, have exploited the human and natural resources of other countries to provide for their nuclear energy needs, resulting in long-term detrimental impacts. These include the destruction of ecosystems and ongoing harm to human health due to persistent radiation exposure, and in particular for indigenous communities still living around uranium mine sites that have never been fully decontaminated. So joining us this evening to discuss this crucially important subject, we have a fantastic panel. We're going to hear from Linda Pence Gunter from Beyond Nuclear, the US anti-nuclear organization. She's joining us from Maryland. Then we're honored to hear from Carletta Tulusi from the Havasupai Tribal Council, Guardians of the Grand Canyon. And then finally, we'll hear from Bruno Chariron, a scientific advisor at the Commission for Independent Research and Information about radiation based in France. So a great panel. Um, you'll no doubt have questions that you want to put to the panel. So can I ask you please to write your questions in the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And when the panel's finished making their contributions, I'll turn to them uh, for the questions. So first of all, we're going to hear from Linda. Linda, thank you so much for uh, working together with us uh, on this webinar. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. And I'm really pleased that we're choosing this subject today because I think that uranium mining is clearly one of the most overlooked areas in the entire nuclear power and nuclear weapons story. Um, I'm going to give kind of an overview uh, of the, this picture worldwide, I'd say, uh, because uranium mining is really the part that no one talks about. You know, when you hear all the propaganda about nuclear power, it's always about the generation phase. They don't talk about the uranium because there's no cover story for this. There's no hiding the horrors of what goes on with uranium mining. So it's just kept hidden and far away, out of sight, out of mind. And when you look at the story of uranium mining across the world, uh, is predominantly targets indigenous communities. And there are so many, you know, what's striking is there's so many similar stories across the world, not only about the devastating health impacts of uranium mining and the consequences of that, but also of the loss of culture, of language, of traditional ways, of sacred sites. And the other thing that links them is the complete failure of the respective governments in those countries to even acknowledge the harms, let alone clean up uh, the sites adequately and make any restitution to the victims. And this, in many ways, is the, the definition of a genocide, you know, because a genocide actually doesn't require a massacre necessarily. It's also the erasure of a people culturally. And that's really what's happened to these communities around the world. They're also connected in a very interesting way, I find, through legends and imagery about uranium. Uh, the Diné of northern Canada in the 1940s mined and shipped uranium to uh, be used for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And they have a story of a shaman who warned of white people coming to dig in the earth there and make iron bars, iron rods that would be dropped by an iron bird on people who looked like them and, and warned them never to go to that place, which is, of course, exactly what happened. The Aboriginal Australians have the rainbow serpent who mustn't be disturbed, who's in the ground and shouldn't be disturbed. Native American culture also has the yellow dust that must be left in the ground 
and to favor the yellow dust of corn instead. And the tragic irony of all of this, of course, is that these cultures, which have been largely uh, destroyed by uranium mining, were forced to violate you know, their own beliefs and fulfill the very prophecies that were warned against. Uh, in the US, of course, uranium was first mined for atomic weapons, predominantly by Native Americans, without knowledge of the risks, without proper protective gear and clothing. Uh, they were told it was their patriotic duty. And uh, so they breathed in the radon gas and the miners wore their work clothes home for their, for their wives to wash. And so not only did the miners themselves suffer the health consequences of exposure, but so did their families. And then, of course, uranium mining continued for the commercial nuclear power sector. Uh, and we see, again, indigenous communities living with the consequences of having their air, water and soil contaminated, not only with radioactive waste, but also with heavy metals, which are also unearthed and are deadly as a result of uranium mining. And this harm continues down generations, not only in the communities that are still mining the uranium, but also in the communities around closed uranium mine sites, because the radioactive contamination has never been adequately cleaned up. And so there's a continued exposure to so-called low dose radiation, which uh, leaves a legacy of harm down generations. And when we think about how that uranium mining was first, how that uranium was first used when it was mined, of course, it was for atomic testing, where again, we see the same story repeated, that these tests were conducted on largely indigenous communities far away from the countries whose bombs they were. So we see in French Polynesia, in Kiribati, in the Marshall Islands, a similar legacy of cancers, other diseases, birth defects, and so on. Uh, down the generations and a failure to adequately recognize, clean up or compensate those communities. And last of all, there's the waste, which is the end phase of the uranium fuel chain, which again is often targeted at indigenous communities. This has been true in Australia. It was true here in the United States where they attempted to put it at Yucca Mountain, which is on Western Shoshone land in Nevada, uh, was defeated for now. And interestingly, the imagery comes up again because the Western Shoshone refer to Yucca Mountain as serpent swimming westward. So we see the repeat of that, uh, that warning. So uranium mining overall is really a story of people deliberately forgotten and ignored. And perhaps one of the greatest examples here in this country, in the United States, is uh, something that almost no one knows about. And that is that the biggest accidental release of radioactive waste did not occur at Three Mile Island, which everybody's heard about. It occurred at Church Rock, New Mexico in the same year, 1979, and ironically on the same date, July 16th, as the first uh, Trinity atomic test uh, in New Mexico. And on that date, on July 16th, 1979, 90 million gallons of liquid radioactive waste and 1,100 tons of solid mill waste burst through a broken dam wall at the Church Rock uranium mill and permanently contaminated the Puerco River, which is an essential water source for Navajo people. And again, that community has never had a full cleanup, no epidemiological studies. You know, people are still suffering there today are still crying out for compensation and support, having to move, in some cases, their families away to protect their children. And it's just out of sight, out of mind. And so the conclusion that I draw through all of this when looking at the stories that repeat themselves around the world, that really, unfortunately, the nuclear power industry in particular is largely a very predatory, colonialist and frankly racist industry that deliberately targets communities that have the fewest resources and are easily ignored. And that's really, I think, the story that you'll find uh, as you look at this across the world. So that's that's all I have to say as a quick overview. Uh, I you know, defer to Carletta, who's lived this. It's an essential to hear from people who've actually lived this experience. And to Bruno, who, of course, has studied this as a scientist and really can help us understand what, it, what these exposures actually are. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Linda. That was uh, really incredibly interesting. And I had absolutely no idea about that that additional uh, terrible release of ra radioactive material that you were talking about there, which is deeply shocking. Um, now we turn to our next speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome 
Carletta Toulouse from the Havasupai Tribal Council, Guardians of the Grand Canyon. Carletta, welcome. Hi, Gamija, everyone. Uh, my name is Carletta Toulouse. I'm from the Havasupai tribe. Uh, it is located in northern Arizona, uh, right on the border of Utah and Arizona, uh, where the Grand Canyon uh, is. And I was born down in Supai Village. We have about 776 tribal members left in my community. And um, we lived down there for, for many, many generations uh, because of the water source. Now, our water source comes from one of the largest uh, groundwater aquifers in the Southwest called the Red Wall Moab Aquifer. And it's just been sustaining uh, my family and my community for many years. So when I was growing up around 1984, 85, we were first uh, approached by mining companies, uh, international mining companies coming onto federal forest service lands, which is adjacent to our reservation. And so what happens off the reservation is gonna affect what's our water source coming onto our reservation. So um, at that time, there were over 300,000 uranium claims on the rims of our canyon home. And so my people, uh, elders at the time and council members felt it was important to stand up against this mining development on the rim of the canyon because of the water. And so it, we have inherited that fight um, over it's been about coming on 35 years Dionne. and um, uh, we have been successful in some areas and in some areas we've we're still fighting um, I'd like to kind of mention that the reason why mining has begun at uh, Pinon Plain Mine operated by um, a Canadian company called Energy Fuels Nuclear uh, is because of the 1872 mining law. It's a very old law here in the United States that allows international mining companies to come on public lands and stake uranium claims. And th this particular mine called Pinon Plain Mine is located on Forest Service lands. And um, it has now been in started operations in December and in January and is operating on an old environmental impact statement, which was approved by the Federal Forest Service. And the tribes here in Arizona are very upset about that. And um, that has been fought in courts and we have lost. And the Forest Service has um, been given the green light by the courts to proceed with their plan of operations. And so there has been, uh, my understanding at the, right now at the moment is 300 tons of uranium have been removed from uh, the ground and placed on site. And they are planning to transport this uranium ore through the cities of Williams and the city of Flagstaff and all the way over to across Navajo Nation up to Blanding, Utah. And near Utah is another community of Utes, uh, Ute, Ute Mountain Utes uh, that will be affected by what's gonna be happening at the mill. So it's a chain reaction of the mining itself, the transportation and the processing is what we're dealing with on this end here in the Southwest. And as mentioned before, um, in I believe it was 2018, uh, I'm sorry, 2017, when the mining company pierced uh, an aquifer right at Red Butte, and it started spewing about nine gallons of water per minute and fresh water. And we're in the desert. And um, it was bringing out 96 
million gallons of water into the mine shaft and the mining company didn't know what to do with it. So they started uh, hauling it off site. And that's when all the tribes and all the communities here in this Arizona started questioning who has oversight over this particular mine. Is it the state? Is it federal? Is it um, county? You know, so those are all the questions that we're asking right now on um, who has oversight on these particular projects on federal forest service lands. You know, uh, we just had a meeting with the uh, EPA uh, in, in Supai Village and at Pinon Plain Mine. We took them out there uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, someone needs to monitor this and someone needs to stop this because they're operating on a very old environmental impact statement and, 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 and being allowed to do this kind of stuff um, on top of one of the oldest and largest aquifers in the Southwest. And, and, uh, and this mining company uh, is also, the mine is located next to our mountain Red Butte, Wikidwisa. And so it doesn't only affect the water, but it also affects our religion and our existence. And so uh, we also worked with the United States uh, USGS uh, Geological Survey and started documenting all the plants and all the animals in the area and explaining to them that uh, they're comparing it to the scientific conceptual risk model. And we wanted to document that our existence, our uh, way of life is terms of of, um, collecting uh, plants for medicine purposes and animal uh, hunting and all of that, um, we are going to be affected one way or another. And I believe um, here in the Southwest, there is a lot of cancer rates and we're experiencing that as well. And um, so it's, it's just something that needs to be stopped. And we're working very hard right now to meet with the governor of Arizona. Um, we have a new governor and uh, we want to make sure that she's aware of what's happening and also to ask her to re-examine uh, the state of Arizona's actions when it comes to fresh water and aquifers in the Grand Canyon region. One so, minute, Carletta. So I just want to say thank you for inviting me and explaining this very briefly. Um, next time, you know, we'd like to show you a little bit more details about uh, what's going on here, but we do need a lot of support and uh, look forward to hearing from every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Carletta. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, our final speaker from the panel this evening is Bruno Chariron. He's scientific advisor at the Commission for Independent Research and Information about Radiation, based in France. Bruno, over to you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, so at CREAD, CREAD has its own uh, private and independent laboratory for monitoring of radiation. Um, it was created in 1986 after the Chernobyl accident, and we've been studying the impact of uranium mines since, let's say, 1990, first of all, in France, because in France, we have about 250 former uranium mines, which are all closed now. The last one was closed in 2001, but the radioactive inheritage is still here even in France. And uh, we also uh, have been monitoring the impact of mines in Namib in Africa, in Namibia, Niger, uh, Gabon. And what we can say is that uh, whatever is the technology used to uh, extract uranium, would it be an open pit or an underground mine or in situ recovery, you always have the problem of bringing into the biosphere radioactive substances. When we are talking about uranium mining, we are talking about uranium, which is radioactive. But as you know, uranium is also 
decaying into 13 other radioactive substances, including a lot of very radiotoxic heavy metals like radium-226 or polonium-210. You remember that polonium-210 is a substance that has been used to poison Litvinenko, the Russian spy in London, at very high doses. But still, it gives an idea of the fact that all those natural radioactive substances are toxic. And it's very well documented now that even at very low doses, the natural radiation, including radon gas that we breathe at home, is responsible for a very clear increase of uh, cancer death, which is this is very well documented now by international epidemiological studies. So if natural radiation already has an impact on human health, everybody can understand that if you uh, put at the surface much higher concentration of uranium, radium, radon, polonium, etc., you increase the level of radiation in the air, in the water, in the soils, in the food, and you in increase the uh, exposure of the workers, of the local communities, to low doses of radiation, but still dangerous doses of radiation. So we have been seeing this more or less at all uranium mines where we made checks. At many mines, you have the problem of the reuse of uh, radioactive rocks, uh, even in France, houses and schools have been built with radioactive rocks from the mines. You have the problem of management of the tailings. For example, in the case of Niger, the company called Cominac, a subsidiary of Arriva, or Rano, the French uh, big company, closed in 2021, but they, they have left two, uh, 20 million tons of radioactive tailings they say they will recover the tailings with uh, rocks, but it's not done yet. And the radioactive dust is still um, diffusing into the environment. And the tailings are not properly confined. I mean, they have already polluted underground water. And this water will probably reach in a few, let's say, 100 years, reach the area where the communities are pumping water for drinking. So what we can say is that the best solution not to um, expose people to radiation around the mines is to leave, to, to let uranium stay in the ground. There is no way to properly extract uranium. Even for example, when we talk about in situ recovery, uh, with in situ recovery, you know that you are, um, uh, installing some drills, you are sending acidic solutions into the soil and pumping those solutions at the other end. So in this case, you will not see huge mountains of radioactive waste, but still you have the contamination of the underground waters. You have the production of scrap, radioactive scrap metal, which people are taking home and reusing. For example, in the case of Africa or France, at conventional mines, we have many cases where the, the communities are actually reusing radioactive equipment. And in the case of France, for example, uh, we made checks, radioactive controls at a mine that was closed 40 years ago, but still in a house uh, a former worker had brought at his home a very active filter from the, the uranium mill and the level of radiation was so high that even across the street and in front of another house across the street we could monitor a high level of radiation. This worker died of uh, leukemia. So let's say that uh, if we talk about the water, the air, the soil, the food, uranium mining is actually a very polluting activity with a very long lasting impact. Even in France, 
at some mines, the uh, operators do not know how to properly decontaminate the water that is still flowing out of the mines that were closed, let's say, 40 years ago. So I may stop there. Thanks very much indeed, Thank Bruno. You. That's a huge amount of really, really interesting information. That's brilliant. And I'm so glad that we are recording this so people will be able to uh, watch it back. And just to clarify for everyone, everyone who's registered for this event will be sent the link to the recording. So we've got um, half an hour now for uh, Q&A. And I'm pleased to say we've got lots of uh, uh, questions in the chat box, the Q, sorry, the Q&A box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, read out a number of them, and then I will ask the panel to uh, respond to any of them that they would like. So I'll do this in a number of sections. So I'll take first maybe four or five questions, turn to the panel, and then when they finished, I'll uh, put more questions to them. So. You don't have to answer them all, obviously, that's up to you. So here goes with the first set. So this is a question um, from Grant Donahue. He says, acknowledging Gadigal land of the Aurora Nation in Australia, how can Australians help to halt the UK's involvement in AUKUS nuclear-powered submarines? Well, that's something that we're quite seized of at the moment, as you can imagine. The panel might like to uh, comment on that. I can certainly comment on that from a C and D perspective um, after they've had their say. Then Tom Cuthbert, um, two questions from Tom. Where is uranium ore processed? For example, in the US and Russia. So could you tell us a bit more about that? And then Alan, oh, and his other question, who buys uranium for the UK and how much does it cost? In what form is it purchased? And then Alan Debenham from Taunton. Hello, Alan. We spoke on the phone yesterday. Alan says, why has the anti-nuclear bombs and power arguments failed so miserably within Parliament, both main parties included? And how can we turn this around, especially this election year across the globe? So that's uh, a range of different types of questions. Um, I'm just going to add one, another one in there because we've got so many. Uh, one more. This is from Anthony Twine. He says, have you explored so-called background radiation levels before, say, 1950 to the present day, um, a radiotoxicological catastrophe? So any information about background radiation level comparisons. So that, that'll do to start off with. Um, which of our panellists would like to start responding to any elements of that that they wish? Linda, is that you indicating? Well, I think the AUKUS one is sort of a little bit off, off topic, but I know that that's something that CND has been involved with, so you could probably address that, Kay. Um, you know, in the US at least, the, the uranium mining uh, activities in the US had been on the decline con uh, considerably until this new push uh, to start opening new uranium mines and create new fuel fabrication facilities. And part of the reason is that most of our fuel now is imported and guess where from? <laughs> Russia is one of the key vendors. It's sort of Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you know, together. Um, so this idea that we need to get away from depending on Russia has actually precipitated uh, a push to start up uh, uranium mining and in and milling and processing and enrichment in this country, which had diminished to very few facilities. I, I think Coletta mentioned the White Mesa Mill, which I think is the last uh, uranium mill operating in the United States. So, so really, that that's a, a pretty critical area. Also, because the um, the fuel that's needed for the so-called new advanced small modular reactors is something called high assay, low enriched uranium, which predominantly at the moment, only comes from Russia. So there's a big push to revitalize the whole uranium industry in this country in order to uh, so-called get off the dependency from Russia. And interestingly, you know, one of the conversion facilities actually owned by Honeywell, which when you look at the sort of don't bank on the bomb 
<laughs> list is one of the companies that is a key nuclear weapons manufacturer as well. So there's a lot of overlap clearly uh, between the nuclear, the military nuclear side and the civil side, but that's really a different topic than the, the mining, which we're trying to focus on today. Oops, thanks very much, Linda. Uh, Carletta, would you like to comment next? Uh, thank you, um, I'll try my best. Um, well, with the mining uh, claims in the Grand Canyon region, um, we have energy fuels resources and they're from Canada and they uh, had the most uh, uranium claims in the area and uh, they had about 84 claims and uh, Vane Minerals is another company from the UK, and they had about 20 claims in the area. And so I just wanted to let you know that in the north and south rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, these are some of the companies that um, were claiming uranium um, sites in the region. And we've been, again, fighting this for majority of my lifetime, and uh, just very recently, uh, President Biden uh, declared a million acres of the Grand Canyon to a national monument. And it is with the support of the 13 tri tribal governments um, that we were able to eliminate many uranium claims on public lands. However, uh, we have uh, two more that are active and that are owned by uh, energy fuels resources. And they're out of um, uh, Boulder, Colorado. And they're also from Canada. And so we're uh, actively fighting those two right now. And especially the one on the South Rim. And they claim that uh, that particular mine is gonna be used for energy and also um, but we're not too sure. We're not getting a straight answer if it's going to be used for military sources or if it's going to be used for energy. Um, because the the biggest um, criticism is that they come and mine and leave, and the United States doesn't benefit from these particular mining companies coming on public lands. So, and they don't have the um, requirement to clean. So it ends up being a super fun site. And that's something that we've been pressuring the EPA to, to pay more attention and the states here um, to pay more attention to stop permitting these mining companies from coming in and doing their dirty work and leaving and leaving a contaminated site. So um, I don't know if there was another question um, that you wanted me to answer. There'll be, there'll be another swathe of questions coming up in a minute, okay. so I'm sure Thank there'll you. be more for you there. Uh, Bruno, over to you. Um, I may say a few words about uh, the question regarding background radiation. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at radiation on Earth today, uh, globally, it's uh, obviously higher than in, the, in 1940, for example. Um, Uranium extraction uh, increases the uh, radioactivity at the surface uh, of the uh, of the earth. I mean, in the waters, in the air. Uh, but not only uranium extraction; you also have the um, uh, the operation of nuclear reactors, and especially the operation of reprocessing plants like La Hague in France. Um, this kind of uh, activities increase the amount of radioactive gases in the atmosphere, including Krypton-85, for example, but also tritium, carbon-14. If we think about the explosion of atomic bombs in the atmosphere, this kind of activity has also increased the amount of radioactive plutonium, strontium, carbon-14, tritium, cesium-137 in the atmosphere. Uh, you have to think also at the nuclear accidents, uh, for example, Chernobyl, Fukushima, etc. So if the question is, is the radioactivity 
the background radiation today on Earth higher than in the 40s? The answer is clearly yes. Thanks very much, Bruno. Okay, I'm just going to um, just comment on a couple of those myself. So first of all, on the question about AUKUS nuclear powered submarines, this is um, the AUKUS agreement between the United States, Britain and Australia. It's a kind of quite fairly extensive military uh, you know, and military material sharing agreement, but the, the core of it um, is the um, provision or assistance to provide um, nuclear weapons, not nuclear weapons, nuclear powered conventional weapons submarines to Australia. So this is something that's been um, under big debate uh, for a few years now. There's a lot of opposition to it. Um, and uh, CND, actually, my own organisation, has been very um, active in opposing it. Um, but, and we've also worked with partner organisations, other campaigns in Australia too. Um, one of the pro big problems we're facing at the moment is the way in which the government, our government, is essentially um, portraying this as a massive um, opportunity, a commercial opportunity, a jobs opportunity, you know, to help um, develop and get Australian investment in um UK submarine production. So there's this kind of whole thing going on around it. Uh, and the part of the problem with that is that some of the trade unions, because they're being told there's lots of jobs in it, some of the trade unions are actually supporting AUKUS. Um, and we've been trying to lobby them uh, against this and, and try and win hearts and minds against AUKUS. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do, uh, Grant, I'm saying that aiming this particularly at you because you asked the question, we've been trying to encourage the Australian trade unions that are very opposed to uh, AUKUS to kind of liaise with and kind of, you know, lobby and discuss with the British trade unions that support AUKUS. You know, so what we would really uh, benefit from is Australian trade union voices directly approaching the British trade unions that support the AUKUS treaty because of the jobs. You know, so anything you can do there, over there, to get your trade unions to sort of win them to um, take that kind of action, that would be really fantastic. And then the other thing I'll just comment on is a uh, response to Alan's question about why is the uh, anti-nuclear bombs and power arguments failed within Parliament? Um, well, not entirely, because there are some parties in the Westminster Parliament that oppose those things. But certainly with the two main parties, this is a, a massive problem. And, um, you know, there's virtually no difference whatsoever between the positions of the Tories and the Labour Party on these issues. In fact, we know that uh, Keir Starmer is going up to Barrow in Furness tomorrow. That's where our um, nuclear submarines are built, you know, to go there and sort of trumpet how much Labour loves and supports the so-called nuclear deterrent. You know, so that's the situation. Um, but I, I mean, there are many reasons for that. But I would just highlight, because in the context of this discussion, the a massive kind of commercial and industrial lobbying upon MPs in both sectors, both the weapons and the power sector. You know, huge efforts are made to uh, win MPs to that kind of position, um, plus the kind of kind of ideological or kind of political thing that um, MPs are sort of told that if they're soft, appear to be soft on defence, they will lose the election. You know, so they have to be really gung-ho about military and gung-ho about nuclear uh, in order to uh, win the election. Of course, we know that's not true because we know the majority of the electorate doesn't support nuclear weapons, for example. But anyway, many reasons, and I won't go on about that anymore, but um, it, it's a very uh, important point and in terms of the election year, Alan, uh, CND will shortly be launching 
its general election campaign, which involves um, writing to all parliamentary candidates, whatever party, asking them for their views on a whole range of issues around power and weapons um, and getting their answers and informing people so people can make the most informed judgment about who they are going to vote for. Right, okay, so on to the next tranche of questions. Well, first, the first one isn't a question, it's a comment, but I will share it because it's important. I think this is from Tom again. He says, we will never forget the visit of the Shoshone people to the UK in the 1990s. Bill Ross, a Shoshone rancher, and his two companions from New Mexico. So thank you so much, Tom, for sharing that memory with us. Um, so another set of questions here. Um, this may be, I don't know, I'll, I'll read these and then if we get more afterwards, we can come on to that if we've got time. So from Anne Frisch, what remuneration from federal government has been made while our insurance agencies cannot or will not cover us for damage? It seems to me that would be influential to people. So that's about remuneration from federal government. Um, Celia Barden says maps of affected areas would be useful. So if anyone knows of suitable maps, please share that in your contribution. Linda Rogers says, is the contamination not a human rights issue? Seems like it to me, Linda. Uh, Anthony Twine, he says, just says cap de la arg, or is that arg? Uh, you mentioned the cap in your previous answers, Bruno, so I don't know if Anthony wants a bit more information about what happens there. Um, Clemens Lichtenberg says, what factor is most frequently overlooked or ignored be it deliberately or accidentally, um, in environmental impact studies that only later proves to be disastrous. So what factors are overlooked in environmental impact studies that prove to be disastrous? And secondly, uh, is there any way to safely mine radioactive material with our current technology available to us? especially where aquifers and underground water are concerned, providing irrigation and drinking water. Companies always promise safe mining, but cannot give a clear explanation how they intend to do it. Why are their promises but the inability to deliver accepted by regulatory authorities? Well, that seems like a really important question to me. And then... Um, I'm just going to do one more and then we come back to the others if we've got time. Uh, from Carol Turner, like most histories of the Manhattan Project, the Oppenheimer film recreated the impression that the nuclear bomb tests were carried out in the desert far from human communities. I'm sure our speakers know this isn't the case. I wonder if all our audience knows this too. Perhaps our speakers can tell us about the campaign which continues to this day for recognition of the environmental and human damage done. And I'm guessing that's around the Manhattan tests. So that's the next swathe. Obviously, if we have time, um, we will come back to the subsequent questions. But um, OK, back to our panel. Who would like to go first on these? Bruno, I see you're unmuted, so why don't you go first? Um, should I say a few more words about uh, La Hague? Yeah, go for, go for it. Um, so the question of La Hague <laughs> is the question of reprocessing. Uh, some countries, not a lot, but France does it. France uh, is reprocessing the spent fuel from the nuclear uh, reactors. The spent fuel from a reactor is a very highly radioactive uh, material. And in the case of France, this material is cut into pieces, dissolved into acid in order to recover some uranium, which
which is left in the spent fuel, some plutonium, and then to try to uh, manage the highly radioactive waste which is left. But this process is creating a huge pollution of the atmosphere because when you crush the uh, spent fuel, a lot of radioactive substances are escaping into the atmosphere, including krypton, tritium, uh, iodine 1 to 9, and uh, this um, factory is also polluting the ocean, uh, uh, La Manche, uh, with uh, um, very uh, numerous radioactive substances, including carbon-14, tritium, um, cesium-137, etc. And it's possible to monitor some of those radioactive substances as far as into the Arctic Sea. Um, maybe a few words about the question regarding the impact studies. Yeah. Uh, impact studies are usually prepared by private companies which are hired by the, uh, the industry. And in most of the impact studies, uh, the actual impact on the communities, on the um, animals, on the plants is not properly studied. Uh, because um, the, um, the scientific uh, knowledge which is used to calculate the doses to the people, to the plants, to the animals is not sound. It is based on um, a very old understanding of the effects of low doses of radiation, which is not, um, uh, which is not appropriate. And uh, also, usually, the impact studies do not uh, cope with the long-term problem of the management of the tailings, the polluted waters. So it's a problem that we see in most of the uh, impact studies in the world. Thanks very much. Uh, Carletta, would you like to contribute next? Uh, thank you, yes. Um... In the case of the Havasupai tribe, uh, the environmental impact statement, which was approved in 1986 and was approved by the Kayabat Forest Service. And that's one federal agency that oversees that particular process. And our argument as a tribe was that it's 2024. It's not 1986 anymore. And economy has changed, laws have changed, which means that the environmental impact statement needs to be updated. And so uh, we lost that case, unfortunately, in court. So they're operating on an old environmental impact statement, uh, which has a lot of loopholes uh, and the cause and the risk is there for contamination. And that is our biggest concern right now um, is that you know those all need to be monitored. All these agencies, including the state and the federal agencies all need to work together to make sure that if there is gonna be mining, it needs to be monitored. And someone needs to be cited when aquifers are being pierced and flooding is occurring. And in our case here, and the south rim of the Grand Canyon, none of that's happening. Um, all the agencies in the states are just pointing fingers at each other. And so now the local governments here and the local tribes are uh, bringing the different agencies together. And we're, we're having our second meeting here in a couple of weeks to discuss that because somebody's gonna be have to be responsible for what's happening at these mine sites. And um, that's our biggest concern and our biggest argument right now. Thanks, Carletta. Linda, over to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just touch on a few of the things that have come up, I think. Um, the question about the maps, there is actually something called the Uranium Atlas, and I put <clears throat> the link to that in the chat, and that's a pretty good uh, global look at the impact of uranium at every phase of the fuel chain around the world. 
Um, the human rights question, yes, clearly it is a human rights issue. It is beginning to be looked at through the lens of the UN rapporteurs, actually. And there's a as a promising one, uh, Marcus Orellano, who's actually based here, is Chilean originally, who is tasked to look at the sort of impact of toxins on the human health and the environment, and I think is is starting to pay attention to this. So uh, I think there's opportunity now. We, we need to feed him information and he is open to receiving it, to getting the UN to take this more seriously. Um, the, the not look, you know, the whole thing about politicians, and I think that, you know, the situation in the UK is identical really to the one here where you've got both parties in favor of opening up uranium mines, of, of producing fuel fabrication facilities, of, of expanding the nuclear power sector. And a lot of it is to do with the lobbying power which we can't compete with. And the other is, you know, the, the, what we're talking about today, which is the sort of human face of the story is not there. All they hear about is, you know, clean, clean energy. They're only talking about the generation phase. They don't look to see where it comes from. You know, I'm, I'm always reminded actually about 40 years ago, my father said to me in a rather sort of remonstrative voice, you know, when you turn the light on, don't you think about where your electricity comes from? And I'm sure at that point, <laughs> my answer was, Probably not, you know, no. And now people are a bit more concerned about climate change and think about the fossil fuel end of it. But when they turn their light on and they see in their bill that some of their electricity is coming from a nuclear power plant, they're not thinking about Carletta. They're thinking about some sort of, you know, rather anesthetic looking building that doesn't look dangerous on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay or something. So the, the human faces of this story are not there in Westminster. They're not there on Capitol Hill. You know, people are not looking at that story, which is why the human rights piece of this is so essential. And um, I think that that the other thing we haven't talked about, which is really a kind of more of a US thing, is the Radiation Exposure and Compensation Act which is actually about to what they call sunset, which means it's going to go away uh, in July, has has moved forward, has been able to include more constituencies. Incredibly, you know, when we talked about Oppenheimer, that first Trinity test, the downwinders of the Trinity test were never considered uh, affected communities uh, in the nuclear sector until now. It's passed through the Senate, thanks to the incredible work of Tina Cordova and others, but it hasn't got through the House. It doesn't look like it will be offered. So this idea that, you know, no one's out there isn't only true of the Trinity test, it's also true of the uranium mining communities, which are far away in places no one goes, easily neglected. It's also true of the waste story, you know, when Yucca Mountain was chosen, it was chosen because no, that there's nothing out there. I mean, that's actually what our Department of Energy said. And, you know, Ian Zabati and others from Western Shoshone pushed back against that mightily because not only are they out there, but there's an immense amount of really unique flora and fauna out there too. So I think all of these pieces of the story are just never told. And that's why we, we're losing the propaganda war <laughs> for sure. But we're not losing the other part of the battle because this whole thing is so dangerous, so expensive, so slow and so unnecessary that the more that we can push that piece of it, I think, you know, stalling for time, delaying things, preventing things from happening is for us, unfortunately, a victory. You know, that's what winning looks like for us. You know, something didn't happen yet. And so the more all the folks on this uh, event today can lend their voices to support the people who are at the front end of this story, you know, who really need the help the most, the better. So, you know, I encourage you to support the Havasupai, to support the Western Shoshone, the Navajo, all the people, you know, the you, everybody that's involved up, you know, on Pine Ridge Reservation. These are places that can use support, financial support, actual support, information, you know, bring bring people in front of your politicians. Let them face the actual human beings who experience that. Let them look people in the eye and tell them this is a clean technology. Because, you know, to answer that final question, no, there's Bruno already answered, but there's no safe way of doing uranium mining. There is no possible way to do this without environmental and health harm. So it, it, as you said, Kate, leave it in the ground. That's the slogan. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Linda. Um, and in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to ask our speakers, I mean, Linda, you were just saying about, you know, support these the campaigns and support the affected communities. Could I ask uh, you and Carletta and Bruno to say if there are any very specific 
ways in which we can do that? You know, are the are there links we can go to if people want to make donations from their organization? Or is the kind of political lobbying specifically uh, that we are able to do? You know, I think people will be moved after today's meeting and want to either get more involved in the campaigning or, or send some support in some uh, concrete way. So uh, Carletta, if I could turn to you, um, for the audience here, is there something very specific that we could do to uh, assist the struggle of the affected communities? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think the biggest um, pressure that we could probably get is from other countries is letting the United States know that uh, nuclear power is not clean and that indigenous peoples, communities, and lives are very important, and that we are uh, uh, a group of people that are endangered, and, um, you know, supporting the, the nations, the tribes that are uh, facing this um, directly every single day. Um, you know, sometimes when we're in this battle, we feel alone, and any kind of um, support would even just an email or uh, support to the tribes is very important because uh, sometimes um, we feel like we're in it by ourselves. So this is very encouraging for me. And then also we need support and learning more about uranium. You know, we're not scientists, you know, um, and really listening to uh, the words of um, Mr. Bruno here. Uh, those are the types of stuff that we knowledge that we need to obtain in our own communities uh, so we can understand it on how it really is affecting. We know it's bad. We know it's dangerous, but we don't know what happens once it moves out of the ground. Um, I think uh, supporting local organizations, NGOs that have been st stood aside us, which, which is the Sierra Club, and the Grand Canyon Trust. The Grand Canyon Trust has worked closely with the Havasupai tribe, and they have a lot of information on their website. Um, you know, our village, we're small, we're in the canyon, so sometimes internet doesn't work very well for us. And um, it's just, again, cl in closing, I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to share our story, our struggle. And uh, my tribe has been at this for so long, and um, we're we're not going to stop, and we're just going to continue to voice our our voices here in in Arizona. To again, yes, leave it in the ground, leave uranium in the ground. Thank you very Thank you. much indeed, Carletta. Thank you. I'm sure the audience this evening will really be motivated um, to take more action and give you more support after this fantastic meeting. Uh, Bruno or Linda, do you? Want to add anything there about what you think we can do? Linda? I, I'm just waving to Bruno because I think Carletta all said it all beautifully. Yeah. I have nothing else to add, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I want to say is that the, it's important that the, commu the affected communities um, get trust into their own ability to understand radiation, to monitor radiation, to, to put pressure on the companies. For example, in the case of Africa, Niger, uh, a group of uh, former workers, they are, they are Tuaregs, Tuaregs uh, uh, are able now to really monitor themselves, uh, the radiation, and to put pressure on the companies, not to change the world, but at least to uh, to have some very bad situations uh, getting a little bit corrected, like uh, when they find radioactive scrap in the in the streets, and it's also the case in in France. So th the point is that it's important to give also resources to the communities uh, so that they can get training equipment, and so that they can get more trust and more ability to say to say no to uh, engineers or uh, uh, people from the industry. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So 
Thank you all of you for coming this evening. Huge thanks to Bruno, to Linda, and particularly Carletta to you for sharing your experience with us today. And thank you all very much and um, see you again soon, I hope. And let's carry on doing what we can. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.